I think Wittgenstein has to be seen as a skeptic, even though he says that, well, we um, accept everything that the ordinary person admits, right? But of course, he also says that the common sense philosopher is not the common sense man, and that's me. That he's still a bit skeptical. Sometimes he says philosophy leaves everything as it is, but uh, that's not necessarily the case. All right, welcome everybody to a brand, very special episode of the Global Skeptics today. I am here joined by a very special person. He needs no introduction. Over my years, uh, over the, my time uh, hosting some of the leading thinkers in philosophy, I've been privileged to do that both on YouTube and Discord. I've hosted many that I've described as some of, uh, one of the greatest living uh, philosophers uh, that um, are currently active in the field. Well, today I present to you the greatest currently living philosopher. Dr. Saul Kripke. Dr. Kripke, what would you like to say? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much so, for this introduction. Yeah thank, th yeah, thank you. I mean, I consider you uh, a huge influence on me. But before we go in there, I just want to say a couple of words. This event would not be possible without the help of several people. First and foremost, we want to thank Dr. Graham Priest. Uh, Saul's, may I call you Saul? Or Yes. Okay. Saul's... Um, colleague at the Cooney Graduate Center. Uh, he reach, uh, helped um, reach out to Dr. Kripke's team. Uh, I would also like to thank all the operatives of uh, the Saul Kripke Center who have uh, helped Dr. Kripke foster his thought, especially Dr. Romina Padro, who has so graciously helped us coordinate uh, the event and the technicalities. So without any further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Kripke. Oh, well, thank you. Wonderful. So, uh, shall we start with a couple of questions? Uh, I mean, sure. So, how fitting then that um, a month and a half ago, right on this show, we had your colleague, uh, Dr. Graham Priest, and we t spoke a little bit about the liar paradox. Now, the liar paradox for a lot of people, for doc as Dr. Uh, Priest has argued, is um, he sees this as problematic and posing some kind of a problem to uh, classical logic, especially the law of non-contradiction. Now, you have argued that the liar, pro uh, the liar paradox um, can be made sense of with classical logic. Could you describe your solution briefly? No, oh, well, it's hard to explain it. I mean, actually, some people would say it was a non-classical logic, but uh, I mean, it's uh, I. Don't countenance just giving in and accepting contradictions. So I um, describe various possibilities using the strong Kleene logic, the weak Kleene logic, actually, and a super supervaluation systems, all of which. Uh, the last supervaluation makes all the classically valid statements come out true, but it's really a different interpretation. Uh, in my paper, I present them as three rival systems, but later I sort of observed that uh, the weak Kleene can be embedded in the strong Kleene and the strong Kleene in the at least the simple supervaluation solution. So um, they are not so much rivals as increasing um, systems. Look, it would be very technical to go into details. So um, it's hard to say. Oh, no, that's fine. I don't know whether I really got very <laughs> Solution I, I see that that's that's totally fine there's no problem okay uh, so I also want to I guess um, yeah I guess a little bit of a non-technical question that I want to ask you I've heard that early in your life you had read the complete works of Shakespeare do you still read Shakespeare 
Well, I haven't read Shakespeare recently. Early in my life, I did not read the complete works of Shakespeare. Maybe it says so in Wikipedia. I did read some works of Shakespeare <laughs> as a child because my parents took me to a performance of He Stoops the, she, she Stoops the Conquer, right? And well, so I read certain plays, Julius Caesar, I think was one. And I read various historical plays, uh, you know, about the struggles in the kings of England and so on, right? I remember as a child thinking, what? That's your cousin. How can you be fighting a war against stuff like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, wonderful. Okay, so Dr. Kupi, now yeah. a little bit of a question that we got um, when it about the um, views on Wittgenstein that people wanted to do. Now, we want you to break your silence on this. Do you believe that uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein would endorse your solution to his skeptical problem? Um, well, it's hard to say that he would specifically endorse anything, but uh, what I call the skeptical solution is, I think, sort of embedded in his later writings. And I take it to be sort of in accordance with his views. Now, I was very cautious in the book about um, saying anything about whether this is um, exactly correct exegesis, because Wittgenstein didn't like to formulate his things in such definite ways. Right? I don't think, however, as some people saying that it's way off and the true interpretation is X or something, which uh, some critics have said. But... I see, wonderful. Um, and Wittgenstein has been very difficult to interpret for a lot of people. And a lot of people have found, um, I'm a big fan of Wittgenstein. I'm, I have to say, <laughs> I mean, Wittgenstein has been somewhat of an inspiration for me in a lot of areas. But there's different um, <clears throat> views on Wittgenstein that I've seen that some people think that Wittgenstein was more of a skeptic and opposed this kind of foundationalism, while others see that, no, he rejected skepticism. Briefly, what's your take on that? Do, do you, how do you see that? I think Wittgenstein has to be seen as a skeptic, even though um, he says that, well, um, accept everything that the ordinary person admits, right? Uh, but of course, he also says that the common sense philosopher is not the common sense man, and that may mean that he's still a bit skeptical, right? <laughs> I was saying, um, well, sometimes he says philosophy leaves everything as it is, but uh, that's not necessarily the case in his comments on mathematics. I don't know, some of his weaker stuff is really comments on the Crudel theorem and the, uh, and, and he also, he grew up where Pantorian jet theory may have thought to be controversial, but I don't think it is anymore. Um, at least it's sort of without people concerning themselves with that theory, it's sort of Im quite embedded in modern mathematics. I see. Okay, so now let's move slightly forward um, with your, um, uh, I believe, colleague, uh, now former colleague, unfortunately, um, Hillary Putnam. Yeah. And uh, he worked, uh, he was an amazing man. Um, yeah. And he, yeah, so he worked um, on the problem. Well, he worked on the problem uh, of um, <clears throat> the brain in a bat. Uh, this is a, I guess, Cartesian, uh, of Cartesian origins. So <clears throat> I believe that uh, Dr. Putnam, if I have my thoughts right, uh, endorsed the causal theory of reference. And he believed that this counterintuitive view would preclude 
uh, there being certain kinds of uh, <clears throat> skeptical scenarios. Now, I would like to hear your thoughts on that, uh, if you have any, like briefly or informally. Uh, do you believe that endorsing some kind of externalist view of language might get us out of certain skeptical problems? I hadn't really thought that. I am not myself particularly fond either of the terms causal theory of reference or oh. externalism, actually. Though it's often, and at least the term causal actually crept into my book, but I actually think of it as sort of historical chain or historical web picture of reference, something like that, right? Um, I doubt that it in and of itself gets you out of any skeptical problems. I, I, I mean, would be used for this. Um, who is the third person? Sorry, that's my co-host, uh, Detroyer. I hope hi that's there. not distracting. Hi, hi. Um, no, I mean, I um, just was assuming that skepticism wasn't true. It would be true that in terms of this theory of reference, if one were like a thing in the batch or whatever this is, right? One's term water would not have the proper link to water, right? Uh, but um, who knows? It might be the problem, part of the, the skeptical thing that um, maybe it doesn't. And who knows whether it's better than phlogiston, uh, you know, right? Yeah, that's nice. I wanted to also ask about that because I've been greatly influenced by your views on language. Yeah. So, oh yeah, I, I think uh, they're magnificent. I mean, you can tell I'm a fan, right? <laughs> so, so, um, so I guess um, I used to, in the past, associate um, some of your views with direct reference theory. And then I was actually listening to one of the professors uh, who was talking who said, no, 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 actually, there is some difference between them. In fact, not all people who are causal theorists. They mentioned, actually, that you had never publicly endorsed direct reference theory. Um, I mean, do you have a, a view on direct reference theory in general? Well, I think, well, I think uh, probably some of the things that apparently might thought to refute it don't on the other hand i've never quite thought that i could see that it was completely true if you mean like the view of nathan solomon or whatever right well in the setup of my book i was more favorable to mill than to uh Frege and Russell about ordinary proper names and such terms, but um, but I don't know whether I could go all the way as I may have seen to at some point. I think so. <clears throat> so um, the question that I also had, which one was? Um, I'm very pleasantly surprised to hear that. Um, you're currently working on a new book, um, collaborating. So I was wondering uh, when, I mean, of course, it might be too early to say, but when can we expect that book and what is the book usually concerned with? Uh, this book is uh, mostly technical stuff and logic. Um, I don't know, maybe Romina Padra knows when it will appear, but she probably doesn't. <laughs> we don't know, right? Uh, Romina thinks that a lot of the paper she has some of the work should have appeared a long time ago because it's um, more than half a century old. <laughs> but um, but still, pe some people have cited it. It's, and it's, it's a collection of papers, all papers in logic, and not necessarily 
so to speak, philosophical logic, the way they talk about it nowadays. I see. Oh, and there's a book on um, computer theory, too. Yeah. Come to think of that, which is based on lectures I gave at Princeton on the subject there. Supposed to be uh, something tying it into um, such stuff as whether truth can be defined in the language itself. Mm -hmm. nice. Okay. Uh, my co-host had a couple of questions uh, to you. Do you want to start with the first one, Detroit? Yeah. The... Hi. But before I do that, I, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. It's really an honor and a privilege to get to speak to you and ask you a question or two. Um, you've been enormously influential on on the field of philosophy, but also on me in particular. So yeah, it's been it's really excellent to see you and, and speak to you here. Um, so I had a question related to negative existentials, a, a sort of a problem in philosophy, which I take to be maybe a little deceptively simple. It's not, not so easy, but it may look so. Um, and I take it that you have suggested something to the effect of, um, you know, the, the negative existential there does not exist in X amounts in some sense to the claim that there is no true proposition which asserts that there is an X. First, is this construal of your view accurate, although incomplete? Um, maybe you could respond to that first. Yeah, I guess there's, there's no true proposition about X. One has to remember that I do think that um, such things as fictional characters are not non-existent, but uh, right. are real entities but abstract and so on i sort of trail off somewhat at the end of my book on reference and existence about that i'm not sure that i found something completely satisfactory but it is i guess um if one really thinks that um something well does not exist, so I mean, one might say that there are no true propositions about that or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I, probably I should refer you to my own lectures where I probably <laughs> am a little bit trailing off, but uh, say something like that. Right. Yeah. That's helpful. And there's like a I wonder if, if the following sort of criticism would be what you would make of the following sort of criticism. What if someone were to think that um, there are no propositions? And um, so the proposition that, say, X exists does not exist because there are no propositions at all. Um, and is this a problem for positive existentials? If, if there being this claim, uh, if the claim that X exists is true, requires that there's a true proposition saying that X exists, and there is no such true proposition, then wouldn't it turn out false? I believe in propositions that would have to formulate all things differently. Right. I was assuming that so I can believe in yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, Dr. Kripke, I also wanted to, we all actually wanted to ask you on your view on metaphysics. Now, in the um, earlier uh, time, well, I guess in the earlier 20th century, there was this push to get rid of most of the metaphysical views. And some people f feel that modern metaphysics really complicates stuff, doesn't bring out anything meaningful. Uh, those kind of things. Now, I'm a big fan of metaphysics. What's your, your take on that? Uh, do you believe that many of the empiricist criticisms mm, on of metaphysics and um, the way philosophers have engaged are really pointless, or do you think that there is a lot of value to see there? Well, you mean the sort of stuff that uh, 30s logical positivism or Ayer said or something? Look, there are, there are metaphysical views, of course, naming a necessity like uh, whether um, 
I could have come from a different sperm and egg and so on. I think those things are simply common sense, right? If there's some pejorative sense of metaphysics, Picayer's example, that the absolute is lazy, a little silly, of course, right? Uh, maybe some such things are indeed meaningless and whatever, right? Um, I don't know whether, well, uh, people have been, we say people have been more metaphysical than I, such as um, David Lewis, especially, right? Which is huge ontology of the whole world, or whatever, right? But, um, and Pliny has not said anything to me about it. Metaphysics, I think, probably, probably this would basically be right. People may think of him as a 20th century metaphysician, too. I think. All right, uh, so let's um, move along slightly because I wanted you to comment on one or two things, I guess, before uh, uh, dropping up. So I've heard certain interpretation, uh, well, certain claims, I would say, um, that you've had uh, critical views when it comes to certain um, views in the philosophy of mind, something like um, perhaps criticism of functionalism, criticism of uh, the, the brain mind identity theory, so on and so forth. Uh, now, again, I've never actually seen anything that explicitly cr critical. So have you taken a critical stance towards these kind of uh, more naturalistic conceptions of the mind, or what's your opinion on them? Or do you usually not comment at all? No, no, I have a paper on functionalism. I uh, tend to think it's something way off, but I don't know if I can repeat the paper in this space. Of oh, that's fine. That's totally fine. <laughs> yeah. I know. Uh, even at its strongest point, um, about very intellectual states of the mind, I don't think it works. And the usual criticism that it uh, does not account for raw fields or, you know, mental states, like, um, auditory states, is a, uh, an example I've just brought, are, I think, um, correct too. Uh, so now, um, most of these dominant theories are not really I see. And yeah, the chair also one. What? Oh, yeah, well, there's a footnote in the Wittgenstein paper about it, I mean, it reminds me. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. Aside from that one, I, I love the Wittgenstein book so much. Okay. So I think uh, Detroyer wanted to uh, ask a question on this one too. Yeah, go ahead. Detroyer. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you do have um, that somewhat famous now argument against the uh, identity yeah. theory. Uh, it's in, in naming necessity. Um, maybe it's meant elsewhere as well, but I'm not sure. Uh, well, simply put, it says that if if some um, expression sort of rigidly designates a mental phenomena and it's said to be co-designated with some expression which uh, rigidly, rigidly designates some neural phenomena, then they are necessarily co-designative, but they are not, and so they are not co-designative at all. Uh, I took that to be one of the sort of arguments you were making. And um, some have responded to this, I think Lewis among others though, um, by saying that, no, the way we refer to uh, our sort of neural term, our mental terms, maybe others aren't really rigid designators. Um, they might refer to different things in different contexts or different possible worlds. And, um, and so maybe there's a way out if they're not rigid in this way. You are, of course, preempted this sort of response and, and, and were critical of it. Um, what, what do you think? 
now? Do you think there's any sort of hope for this approach or is it still um, pretty implausible? It's, I think it's way off. David actually arrived at after a certain point. Because I still remember when I gave a talk, he said, you have to admit the plausibility of the rigidity idea, right? For, um, but he also then invoked counterpart theory and said there are other counterpart relations in which it is not rigid. Right? And so was trying to make a counterpart. No, that's not what he finally came up with in the end. Right. I see. Uh, okay. So I guess um, we had one on slightly. I think we had one on slightly the um, lighter note about um, uh, your view of how philosophy has advanced um, since your time to today. Do you see a significant progress in how uh, people approach um, the field? Uh, what a new, uh, maybe whatever new progress may have developed. What's your take on that? Okay, well, I probably can't really comment very informatively on the contemporary thing, so I probably will pass on that one. No doubt, a lot of good work has been done. You know, uh, one. One thing about philosophy in general is that there is there are linear projects upward. Well, I think new views that may sort of illuminate some of the old ones are being developed. Um, going back to the comment on David Lewis, you know, my whole take on what's wrong with functionalism applied to what he said was about, you know. Pain states and so on, right? Yeah. I see. Yeah. And I also wanted to get your opinion on what one uh, philosopher who has unfortunately passed away. He was a giant in his field, a uh, Harvard professor, Dr. Willard Quine. Um, ha do you have an opinion on his views? Do you think that, um, I mean, no, I, I don't think anybody could deny that he was a wonderful philosopher, but what has your interaction been with his work and his thoughts? Well, I had a surprisingly good interaction with him, at least sort of toward the end of my day at Harvard, given that I actually um, am a critic of most of his most famous views. I probably have been influenced, say, by his um, <coughs> idea that uh, the normal interpretation of the quantifier is um, they tell you what they're what you were ontologically committed to. So I even have some reservations about some things he says about that. But I'm uh, probably probably influenced on all kinds of ways. Technically, I thought like that you could, you could formulate the language without property individual constants or function symbols was influential on me, though um, some people are still kind of just avoiding various properties like not doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I see. In his most famous things, so like uh, rejection of modal object, obviously I don't hold to that, right? And um, and I've sort of said enough of that. And have little notions in ordinary discourse and so forth. Uh, and I, of course, identify epistemic and what I call metaphysical, or you might just call it counterfactual, right? Necessity, which I don't. His idea of logic being empirical and so forth, I. Um, never accepted and have lectured on it. And well, I've written a paper on it, which may be coming out reasonably soon. We don't really know, right? Yeah. I mean, it's part of it. Oh, and the, yeah. Okay, Ramin is reminding me that I thought the ending of truth by convention was quite a good argument. 
unfortunately, it could be deployed against Klein's views on the nature of logic itself. So he doesn't uh, seem to think that later. But uh, that was a very influential argument I made. I mean, of course, I see. he says it's sort of based on Lewis Carroll's Bickley's notorious paper, which mm -hmm. is a paper too. I think the Troyer had uh, another question about identity over time. Uh, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, so just a, uh, a question about identity, I guess identity over time as well. So like when we say something like, oh, I could not have been a credit card, or my lamp could not have been made of ice, or uh, so yeah. forth, we are listing some of the necessary, the sort of criteria that something must have in order to count as me or, or as my lamp. And it's trivial to provide more you know, so-called essential features of things. Um, however, do you think that there is in principle like a set of necessary and sufficient criteria of these sorts? Um, no, I don't base anything on that idea. And not over time either. I don't think one should think of oneself as sort of a union of time slices that has to be. You know, though I never published it, uh, you know, I've thought of a rotating disk problem and also one of an infinite river and some other things. It's going against what people at least used to say about this, including Quine, uh, and at least in an early paper, Identity, Extension, and Hypothesis, which actually has some good stuff in it that I do like the thing. It's created the idea that one splices things together from temporary things. I don't think he ultimately held that. He and David Lewis held the very, what seems to me the very strange view that uh, the real ontology just is, well, that of all sorts of scattered objects, like that might include the thing that is that is me up to a certain time and the Eiffel Tower thereafter. In fact, that's a very simple case. There are all kinds of weird temporally scattered objects that supposedly should really be admitted into our ontology. Just, just a, if you can that's, yeah. That's great. Just a, just a quick follow up on that. Um, some. Do you worry? Do you think there's any uh, sense to the worry that okay, if we don't have clear criteria of identity, um, then maybe we won't have clear criteria of like trans-world identity, and this might undermine some of the the well, you know, statements I, we might want to make. Gosh, in my book, I reject the I demand for criteria of trans-world identity. I think it's part of our notion of counterfactual things. Sometimes what things are in it and we don't have to somehow re-identify them in terms of criteria of identity. I also, however, and this is something I, for example, agree with David Lewis about, is that um, though people think there has been an intelligible demand for, for criteria of identity, and that it supposedly may go back to Frege. I don't think anyone has really said what a criterion of identity is or why we always have to have one. Hmm. All right, so a couple of more things before uh, we wrap up. I hope we haven't bored you, Dr. Kripke, with these kind of questions. <laughs> I mean, I know you, you uh, get asked. Oh, I apologize. We, I hope we haven't been... Uh, too much. <laughs> I see. All right. So, um, from the views you outline in naming and necessity, uh, is there anything that you've changed after that? Any any view that you've either revised or clarified, or do do you do you pretty much hold to everything you've outlined in naming and necessity? I pretty much hold to everything. The thing on a puzzle about belief may. I think in naming a necessity, I accept as uncontroversial that some identity statements between names are not a priori. So I 
therefore reject complete millionism. But in the puzzle about belief, I think that the arguments that supposedly support such a rejection are pretty unclear. So um, that might be a change from uh, naming a necessity. Okay, there have been some counter arguments to what I say about mental uh, states and material states. Actually, I think what I say about that is what we would intuitively believe in the beginning. So I think uh, I'm not really repudiating that. Um, I think I probably have given good arguments about it, but um, I really should go through some of the critical literature on it to be sure. Okay. Um, you know, they came from that uh, in order to support these uh, identities of mental and material states, they were just like various other contingent, supposedly contingent identities, such as water is H2O. And I don't think those are contingent identities, of course. Mm. And Dr. Kripke, just leading up to the last question, I think that the Torah has, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the views on modality, um, I b believe there is a, a lot of people are arguing for having a metaphysical modality, something that I think is in the category of logical modality, but is slightly distinct. Do you have a take on metaphysical modality in general, because I've often heard uh, the existence of such modality being defended uh, with your work when it comes to synthetic identities. Do, do you have a view on that at all or no? Well, I thought I used the term metaphysical possibility in my book. So I don't know if these people are using it differently or I may not have read them. If they're using it the way I do, then of course I accept them. I see. All right. Uh, so, Detroit, do you want to go ahead? Often when people talk about or employ terms like possible, impossible, or, or speak about uh, possible worlds, they assume that these expressions are in some sense basic, not requiring some further sort of formal system um, in order to be meaningful, like, say, logic. Um, someone might say, for example, oh, okay, P is possible if we mean by that that it in conjunction with certain logical axioms is not a contradiction but it's really impossible like simplicity um d does this approach make any sense to you um or or is it like misleading or what do you think about someone who defends a, a, a view like that well i'm not sure what the view is i probably hold it i mean it, but, saying something is possible is sort of primitive yeah, in other words, I think I, I think I believe that really. My own work on the um, possible world semantics was not so much really to explain possibility to someone who doesn't understand it, but to show how um, if we uh, employ this apparatus as possible worlds, the basic notions of logic like satisfiability, completeness theorem and so on like that can be rigorously defined and uh, the uh, arguments prove, right? Or disprove, yeah, right. Right, but I mean, I guess part of the idea is that, look, if we're thinking about the set of possible worlds, um, what that set looks like or what things are included in that set depends on, um, I think at least, what sort of logic we have in mind right if it's if it's logically possible worlds then okay what logic <laughs> um it, is it is there some sense to saying that no 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 independent of those considerations there just is a set of possible worlds and then we can use those to talk about well, i don't yeah. know if they really form a set that was part of in the sense of set theory right they might be a proper class you know it might be possible for any transfinite n that there could have been n particulars. At least we can't rule that out a priori, right? 
Um, yeah, I, uh, well, modulo various things. And of course it does depend on the interpretation of what kind of possibility one's talking about. I think there probably is a definite bunch of metaphysically possible worlds. Of course, in my, in the formulation of modal logic, one doesn't assume anything about what they are and the uh, completeness theorems are for arbitrary sets of possible worlds, right? Related by some relative possibility relation. All right, thank you. Okay. Right. So just a couple of more questions that we had. Um, we're um, wrapping it up pretty much because I guess that's the allowed time. Yeah. So uh, just a couple more. One is I wanted to what What's your general take on like the problems of like extreme skepticism, where, um, you know the uh, scenarios of like bring the VAT scenario. Do, do you have a stance of approaching skeptical problems? Do you take any stance, or is that something you do not uh, touch on uh, in your recent uh, publications? I probably have not, as you say, touched on it in my recent yeah. publications. It originally is what got me interested in philosophy. Well, it wasn't entirely complete global skepticism, but I did ask my father, and I was probably just 12 years old or something, uh, look, how do I know that I'm not dreaming now? I still think that that's a difficult problem. I mean, right now I feel quite certain that I'm not dreaming. Why is that? Because of course I have dreamt and was in no doubt about most of the time that I uh, wasn't dreaming. Well, it wouldn't occur to me that I was dreaming, right? So uh, anyway, my father said, well, when you go to college, you can read the philosopher Descartes who begins his philosophical work with that very question. And I found a copy of a book by this man. I mean, this was the what first coming into philosophy, uh, whom I would have called Descartes as my father and not as it was called Descartes. Uh, around it was the, the meditation, you know, and a bit of other stuff. So right. And so I started reading it, and then I got interested in the subject. I read various other people, right? I see. And so that would get skepticism. But I don't know whether I really have gotten any solutions, or even to that problem, which seems to me to be sort of real. Hmm. Okay, so uh, last couple of questions. Uh, on causal theory, I've heard certain, I guess, naive criticisms, but uh, so s some people, for example, say that, you know, causal theory or some variants of it have this view that uh, you have a very strong connection between strong causal relation, even if the reference is not firmly established. So the view is if somebody sits down a, somewhere and just overhears some kind of a name that might not even refer to anybody or something like that. Does that mean that they have a causal connection with that? That kind of naive criticism I'm just recalling off the top of my head. I'm sure, sorry, go ahead. You already understand. I like the term causal theory of reference so much, but I don't in fact think that I have established that uh, or argued that just hearing such a thing is sufficient to be um, having that name in an ordinary sense. One might indeed even have to hear something said about who that is, though that might represent a popular misconception. Um, so it's unclear what um, criteria there are, right? I certainly have taken pains in the book to put um, a lot of leeway. Now, if the name is in fact empty, then of course nothing has been named. Well, one. I see. Yeah. I see. Well, Dr. Kripke, I want to thank you so much for um, 
graciously spending your time with us. Okay, thank you very much. For yeah, I would also like to thank uh, very much your um, d director of the Salt Creek Center, Romina Padro, without oh. whom this event would not have happened. Uh, Dr. Graham Priest, who also helped out and uh, all the people that have operated the Salt Kripke Center over the years and have uh, helped get your work to wider audience. And of course, thank you so much. I already said that, I'm repeating myself, for uh, taking your time to uh, appear here to share your insight. Uh, are there any concluding remarks you would like to say? No, that's fine. Well, thank you very much.